Welcome to Grammar Talk. Today we'll be covering some common mistakes in usage and syntax. Let's begin with our first example. Among other things, Linda should have known it was unnatural to marry a Ferris wheel. Again. Among other things, Linda should have known it was unnatural to marry a Ferris wheel. In this sentence, among other things is a dangling modifier, although some grammarians would accept it as a sentence adverb similar to hopefully or unfortunately. We prefer. Hopefully, Linda will not marry that Ferris wheel on account of she could catch a social disease from among other things which have rubbed on the seats, unfortunately. Perfect. Now let's hear another example. Calvin is one of the only people who will let a robot check his prostate. Again. Calvin is one of the only people who will let a robot check his prostate. This is a common mistake. The word only contains the idea of one or singularity. You cannot be one of the only. We prefer. Anyways, Calvin was one of the few people who did not know the robot was really an escaped clown from the local derangement facility. Much better. I think we have time for one last example. There are three things you must do when wild pigs are chasing your dirt bike. E.g., stay calm, don't ride the brakes, steer toward the coyotes. Again. There are three things you must do when wild pigs are chasing your dirt bike. E.g., stay calm, don't ride the brakes, steer toward the coyotes. E.g. means for example. You should not use it if you're giving all the available examples. We prefer going forward. I will put the dirt bike in reverse while the pigs and coyotes and etc. and so forth are eating Dave. That's all we have time for today on Grammar Talk. Remember, adding the ingredients in this order ensures failed chiffon cakes made at home is not an option. So always strive for clarity. And now, the person whom Rob Ford said he bought his crack pipe from, is that correct? Colin McEnroe. Yes, it is National Grammar Day, uh, celebrated in your own manner, uh, but we are celebrating it here with a show about words, usage, kind of the changing nature of language, too. Uh, a little bit later in the show, in fact, you'll actually hear um, a pretty dramatic z- example of the changing nature of language. Uh, towards the end of the show, we'll be talking to uh, someone who's written a book about the way words were used in colonial speech, so whether or not you and Samuel Adams would understand one another, not the, the, not the beer, the person. Uh, and also, we'll uh, be a little bit later talk, be talking to uh, someone from Great Britain uh, about an apostrophe crisis that they are having over there. We're having an apostrophe crisis over here, too. Uh, they're having a slightly different kind of one. So anyway, that is still to come. Uh, right now, though, Peter Sokolowski is uh, here in studio. He's editor-at-large at Merriam-Webster, blogs at Merriam-Webster, unabridged, appears in Ask the Editor videos at merriam and was named among Time's 140 best Twitter feeds of 2013. <laughs> That's immortality right there. You, know, you should only just say that. That should be the only thing. <laughs> On your CV. Uh, all right. And I think in just a moment, I don't think we have the ISDN connection yet, but uh, uh, well, joining us from KUNR in Reno, Nevada, Mignon Fogarty, uh, better known as the podcaster Grammar Girl, uh, will be joining us. Anyway, we'll introduce her when the time comes. Um, we already have one call from, from one of our affiliates in Baltimore, Maryland, and I know what this is about. But uh, so, uh, or actually, I should say, I know what this is around. In fact, you know what, Peter? <laughs> Let's just take the call because we'll get it out, out of the way. And it actually is something that's genuinely troubling to this man. So joining us now is Scott from Baltimore, Maryland. What's on your mind? Hello, Colin. How are you? Just fine. So I wanted to ask you and your panelists about what I regard as the overuse and misuse of the preposition around. You hear it all over the place these days. People say things like, we've had some conversation around this idea, or he's an expert around technology, or we have metrics around this. And... (laughs) I, I think that's uh, an incorrect use of the preposition around. All right. Well, first of all, I, I, I know that uh, this has concerned you for quite some time <laughs> and that you have actually compiled not just those three examples, but in fact, hundreds and hundreds of examples of a way in which you are driven, being driven crazy by this one fluke in the language. So, um, so Peter, you tend to be descriptive sometimes rather than prescriptive. Mm-hmm. This is something that's absolutely going on. It's driving at least one person <laughs> crazy and probably more. Um, so what's your take? Well, overuse of anything drives you crazy, doesn't it? I mean, it, 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 that's um, not just grammar. That's not just usage, not just language. Um, you know, I always say I, I just cherish people's concern and care uh, about language and someone like 
uh, like Scott, who yeah, who yeah. who uh, who you know who's very careful about uh, language. I mean, y- you can only um, you can only be a good example for everyone around you, and you know, knowing the good grammar rules really is uh, your key to clarity and elegance of expression. Um, complaining about others <laughs> um, is, is, is another story. You might be, there might be kind of an adverbial use in that uh, as well. In other words, you, this may be not just the preposition around, but the adverb around um, that, that, that's bothering you. And I just suspect that anything that's overused becomes annoying, period. And that's not just linguistic. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think your problem is necessarily only a linguistic one, but I do think making a good example for everyone around you by not doing that is one of the best things you can do. And you well, just well, used the word this, around correctly, too. I'd like to yeah. say. <laughs> see, see, this is the problem. No one is willing to come out and say categorically that the usages that I've just listed mm-hmm. are incorrect, Overused right. or underused. A, a local columnist recently wrote in the Hartford Current, quote, around has two prepositional meanings. Pertaining to is not one of them. <laughs> that was uh, me. That, and, that, and that was... <laughs> I, I think that was a guy named McEnroe. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, so in other words, what he's talking about, Peter, is not an adverbial use, really. Pe- what people are doing, particularly in a business environment or in the world of... Uh, of sort of bureaucracies and yeah. edu- education reform speak and stuff like that, you encounter around as a substitute for either about yes. or pertaining to. Right, right, right. So you're talking about sloppy use. And that's and, and, and I, I do agree that, of course, that's where good copy editing comes in. That's where careful knowledge comes in. And you're also talking about professional use of language if you're talking about business language. And that is a place where we have to pay attention. We have to, 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 to be careful. I mean, this sort of uh, – uh, the, 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 the basic idea is that we are all – always judged by our use of language, by the way that we sound and the way uh, we write. Um, It's possible that we have different registers. There's a way you speak in in the house and around your family, among your friends. Um, And then there's a way that you write and and speak professionally. And it's true that we have to be careful um, if we don't want to be judged as you are doing. (laughs) Um, And so I do do agree that, of course, we should be very careful, especially in professional and edited text. There's, he did use the word sloppy, so that, that should make you feel better. He used a pejorative <laughs> word. That should make well, you feel you. somewhat better. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback, and I just hope later in the show you can discuss dangling modifiers because uh, I enjoy talking about them as well. All right. Oh, excellent. We have many examples uh, of those. But, you know, I mean, he's sort of describing a phenomenon that you deal with all the time, Peter, which mm. is that there's a point at which, you know, if you work in a company of 200 people, you know, who are in marketing or, or, or whatever field it is, and they're all using around that way and mm. you're not if 199 people are are using that way and so th- so that you're sitting in meetings scribbling down all these horrible offensive uses of it uh and and you are increasingly painted into this corner <laughs> which you alone inhabit you you basically have lost the battle right well and that's an interesting question because of course the you know language is funny the only constant about language is change that's one thing um and uh, you know, we, we fi- <laughs> um, you know, we find that you can't teach grammar by uh, by legislation. You know, uh, other cultures such as France or Spain that have royal academies, um, they make their pronouncements, and in fact, those pronouncements very seldom have any effect at all. Uh, languages certainly do follow rules, but they don't follow orders. And so uh, if you have a very common usage that has become so common that to be spread among a, a, a wide number of people, it's true. It will be recorded in the dictionary. Now, if it's an erroneous one, it will also be recorded as an error in the dictionary, I hasten to add. Uh, but again, I just say be a good editor, be a good speaker, be a good writer, and be a good example for the others. There is sometimes uh, a sense that one is piling up sandbags against an <laughs> on- oncoming tide, you know. So for a long time, and, and I know I know enough to know that I was never even strictly right about this, but uh, for a long time I have insisted on teenage children as opposed mm-hmm. to teenage children, mm-hmm. my feeling being that teenage really can't be used in a kind of adjectival way there, mm. the teenaged. And, and, and I know that the, you know anybody working at any dictionary will disagree with me about that and say, and say but the, here's the problem. Now people say old fashioned. That that comes right to mind, and that one I I will say I notice every time, and uh, it does sort of bug me. But think about this one. Do you call it iced cream? That's another good one. Yeah. So that the fact is, what we've seen is in these instances, um, they're all making the same movement in the same direction, but they happened at different times. So iced ice cream doesn't bother you and me. Old fashioned. 
without old fashioned old like old fashioned days. I see that sometimes. Yeah. Um, boxed sets is gone. Mm. Uh, it's just box is sets. Is it really? Now. It's yeah. box sets? It's, that's what, that's yeah, what you that's see. And, and so the fact is, I noticed old-fashioned and boxed sets having uh, sort of vanished in the period in which I was conscious of, of this kind of thing. Um, but ice cream happened long before I was. Yeah, and it's, you know? and it's idiom- idiomatic. It's, it becomes idiomatic and it becomes a habit. Language, broadly speaking, is a habit. So the fact is, the, the, the rules of, of, of grammar and of English are remarkably resilient. We still have uh, so many distinctions that we hold dear in the English language. Some, like these, are changing right before our eyes. And the problem with language is it changes just fast enough that we notice. And it's the things that we notice that bother us the most. For example, impact as a verb. For ex- mm-hmm. you know, A lot of people don't like that. When our unabridged edition came out in 1961, the New York Times criticized Merriam-Webster's dictionary twice in the same week for the inclusion of the word finalize. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a word that you probably don't object to. No. Uh, it's probably your copy editors won't stop you from using it. But at the New York Times, it was absolutely uh, not allowed in their uh, writing, and they did not like seeing it in the dictionary, sort of sanctioned, according to them, by the, the so-called authority of the dictionary. And we can get back to that later. But what's interesting is that now, two generations later, no one objects to that word. And mm-hmm. so we can see over time uh, that change does happen. All you have to do is read a page of Shakespeare, and you know that language changes. But once again, I, and I, I object uh, in, um, in, in uh, rhetorically and physically to slippery slopes. But, <laughs> yes. But, you know, you, you, you take something like impact. So everybody decides, all right, so it, it, was, it was never that ugly a construction anyway because certainly people probably were willing to talk about a meteor impacting Earth a mm-hmm, long time mm-hmm, before exactly. they were willing to tolerate People talking about impacting their impacting their options, which I never understood anyway. But right. um, but whatever that means, I mean, it's getting more and more acceptable. The difficulty is now you have impactful. Yes, it, it creates what we call a back formation, and now you now you've created the, you know the, the different parts of speech from it. And I agree, it, 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 that that becomes a slippery slope. But if you look at across the history of English, funny things happen. For example, text as a verb, which people sort of objected to for about half a minute, and then they realized, well, we need a name for this. We need a word for this uh, for this action. And it turns out Shakespeare used it in Much Ado About Nothing. You know, text me a sign. In other words put letters on a sign, uh, and he used it ver- very much as we use it today uh, as, a, as a verb. So uh, the fact is language is elastic in that way uh, to accommodate new technology and, and the changes in culture. I don't say that, you know, we throw the baby out with the bathwater, however, because clarity and elegance are always cl- clear and elegant, and uh, we, we value those things too. Uh, our number, by the way, we haven't even given out the number yet, and there's a bunch of calls on the board. 860-275-7266. You're celebrating, if that's the right word, National Grammar <laughs> Day with us. 860-275-7266. You may tweet us at WNPR Colin. Mm. And we've got the ISDN uh, line working, too, so let's welcome also to the show. And callers that are on the board right now, I swear I will get to you. Uh, Mignon Fogarty uh, joins us. She's better known as the podcaster Grammar Girl and is the author of the New York Times bestseller Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing and the Grammar Devotional. She's currently developing a card game called Peeve Wars. Oh, we can't wait to hear about Peeve Wars. <laughs> Minion Fogarty, are you there? Yes, happy National Grammar Day. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you, uh, too. So Peter and I, been, I know you and Peter know each other, and we, by, we, we've been talking a little bit uh, about sort of the way the language shifts and changes in sort of prescriptive, uh, uh, prescriptive versus descriptive uh, arguments. Um, one of the things that you've been trying to do, both of you have been trying to do, is also look at this rushing tide of digital language, right? The way that people uh, communicate on the Internet. Digital language is probably a misprision of some kind, but uh, it's, it's more like sign language, right? That's digital language. But uh, yeah, and, and so uh, this is something that it's hard to keep up with, but you really do have a lot of people at keyboards now who are either innovating in marvelous ways that enrich the language or completely tearing it to shreds. And I'm not really sh- sure how you even begin deciding which one is which. Mignon, you want to tackle that one a little bit? Right. Well, there are a lot of new ways to play with language that, you know, we, we didn't have when I was a kid. You know, lol cats, for example, <laughs> you know, the pictures with cats speaking on them are, you know, words that are associated with cats. And linguists have found that lol cats has its own grammar. Like It's, it's a system of grammar. It's not just random. And I recently saw a, a similar analysis about uh, doji, dog, mm-hmm. D-O-G-E. It's another meme that's going around. And and there is a specific grammar to the way that people are playing with language in that way. So I think it, it's interesting that people have all these new ways to to use language and play with it. And, and I, I really don't think that it it harms uh, learning to write 
um, in standard English either. You know, I think it's important for teachers and parents to to make sure their kids know that, you know, you don't want to use lolcats grammar in <laughs> a job application or your essay for school. But but I don't think that playing in one way inhibits learning in another. And, and Peter, I'm also wondering whether authority is shifting a little bit, mm-hmm. too. I mean, in other, in other words, Merriam-Webster can sit there and try to police what's going on in the Internet. Um, and, and, I'm, and I know that you do to a certain degree. <laughs> or police is the wrong word, but at least sort of <laughs> observe, describe, codify, accept, mm-hmm. reject. Uh, but on the other hand, there's, I think, an argument that maybe the Internet should be figuring all this stuff out. And, and right. there seem to be some Internet sites trying to do that, right? Well, yes. And the fact is the Internet means written communication for many, many of us. If we, if we work in an office, if we work online, we're writing more probably today than uh, our equivalent in this in this position a generation ago. So the fact is language is still incredibly important. Spelling is important. Everything counts these days. Um, and, you know, we see, as as, as, uh, as Mignon said, and hi, Mignon, by the way, nice hey. to hear your voice, um, uh, we see things uh, grammatically like, uh, like the prepositional because, for example, you know, because science, because winter. Uh, that clearly has evolved because of Twitter and Facebook and other really abbreviated forms of communication. And it's turned into its own kind of rhetoric, its own kind of, uh, of, of snark, if you will, its own kind of uh, uh, commentary. We might want to just flesh that one out for our uh, listeners who are not super internet friendly. So in other words, the construction would be, I'm really miserable because winter. Yes, exactly. And that was, I think, the, the American Dialect Society's uh, word of the year uh, for the year. Am I right about that? I think you're right. Yeah. yeah and, and at any rate, it's gotten all kinds of attention from very serious linguists at Language Log and at the Chronicle of higher ed. Um, writers like Ben Zimmer, who writes a lot about language, um, have, have covered this. And uh, as linguists do, they treat language uh, as a science. And they looked at it, and they look at the at the way that it breaks down. And sure enough, as, as Mignon said, there's a grammar to all of this. And uh, the fact is, we're judged, as I said, by uh, how we present ourselves. And if we present ourselves online, then uh, we'd probably care about things like spelling and grammar. And Mignon, for example, the one that he's just talking about right now, the, the because... Uh, followed by a, a vast ellipsis. <laughs> um, I kind of like that. I mean, mm. I, I, I'm I'm a declinist. I'm an old fart. Uh, mm-hmm. But somehow or other, there, uh, there's something colorful about that. But I, once again, we're in, into a pretty subjective area sometimes with this. Right. It's fun. Um, Neil Whitman covered that on the Grammar Girl website, yes. too. And, uh, you know, it's fun. It's it's a fun way to use language. It shows up a lot on Tumblr and and Twitter and Facebook, and, and those are the appropriate venues to use that kind of language. Again, you have to know the difference between when it's appropriate to use it and when it's not. You wouldn't use it, you know, in a school essay or a cover letter for a job, but, but, it, but it's fun to play with. If I remember right, Neil traced it back to possibly starting on Saturday Night Live, oh. um, a sketch that they did back then, and then there was some controversy about whether that was really the origin or not. But, but it's, it's often interesting to try to trace these things back to their origin. Um, tell us about your peeve game, uh, uh, and I, I wanna, I'm, I'm interested to know even who it's pitched at, the, the innovators or the, uh, the, the holders of the line. Right. Well, thanks. So it is a card game based on grammar pet peeves. So, for example, there's a card with the literally, and it's <laughs> literally the most annoying card ever. And, <laughs> and I've always imagined pet peeves are little monsters. And so they're cartoon monsters, and you play your cards on the table to amass an army of peeves, which you then use to annoy your opponents to death. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I made it... Lo- for me, largely, but I imagine copy editors and writers and, and teachers would love it. It's, it's mostly just for fun. It's, it's not all that educational, <laughs> but it's, it's a great fun. And we're actually, I'm watching on my iPad, we're $500 away from funding the project. I'm doing go. it through crowdfunding. Ah. So you can actually get a deck for yourself at fundanything.com slash peeve wars. <laughs> and it's only available for a few more days, and then I'm going to print the decks. So a lot of fun. That's exciting. Well, it is educational in this way, and that is uh, it will bring to uh, light those usage controversies that, that you might not be aware of. You know, uh, a usage controversy is, for example, the literally one, you know, literally used figuratively. Mm-hmm. Um, or, for example, uh, fewer versus less than, you know, th- th- this kind of thing. Can you end a sentence with a preposition? All these kinds of questions. And I bet a lot of them are part of your game, Mignon, so, right. that, so that this makes people, even if they are aware and they're careful about the use of language, they may not know that this is a sort of famous old saw among language lovers. 
Another popular card is very unique. Oh, there we because go. You shouldn't modify an absolute like unique. <laughs> and the, the rule that goes with the card is that you can only have one in play at a time. So if you play your very unique card, your opponents have to discard their very unique card. So it does the, the rules, for the most part, go with the peeve and, and reinforce why it's annoying. All right, actually, let's uh, let's take somebody with a P. We've got, well, I've got a full board of phone calls, which I, I think almost went without saying uh, with a topic like this. But here's uh, Craig in Hartford with a P. Hi, Craig. Uh, Greg, you mean? Oh, it's Greg. I'm sorry. Already, already something's <laughs> gone wrong. I just, yeah, uh, just wondered how you made out that cracked coffee cup symbolism, uh, mysterious stuff there. Oh, uh, that's another. It's a whole. Se- question, it's a whole right. separate story. Uh, this is one that uh, even the most intellectual of people, including Garrison Keillor, mess up, and that is entitled versus title. And it's though maybe the book is entitled to a fair trial. <laughs> <laughs> one of my pet peeves. I, you know, have to come across that one. I hadn't really thought about that one before, but uh, and Peter, uh, Chris, Peter's online with this stuff. He's kind of checking it out right now. So, uh, and, and I, I might have done something like that. It's a book entitled a "Tale of Two Cities," mm. but it really—he's saying it really should be titled. Well, there, I mean, entitled, uh, you know, it's a, an old word in English, and it goes back to the 14th century, and we do give it. Uh, the definition of to give a title to, to end title, um, and that's the older, that is to say the first definition, the, the, the older one in the English language. So the fact is, we, we, this is like so many other words in English, we, we have such an elastic language, we have two words for the same thing. Uh, and uh, the original uh, sense of title is also to provide a title for. So the fact is, you've got some uh, some synonyms here, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too too much about that one. That 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 one, uh, you know, comes from the French uh, from the Latin, which means you know to give a title to. Yeah, uh, Greg, I will sit down and talk to Garrison Keillor about this, but I, I actually <laughs> I don't feel like it's a, something worth starting a fight over. But you know, we're getting into that prescriptive versus descriptive question too, as well. So let's talk, I talked to Nancy from Windsor about this because I think uh, Peter and Mignon can can riff a little bit on what she wants to say. Hi. Hi. Um. Uh, I. I am very interested in prescriptive dictionaries versus descriptive. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, to the lady who was uh, screening calls that I am an old fart. However, I also love the language. I lo- do love to play with it. But I, I, I would be interested in opinions as to which, besides the OED, would be the best prescriptive dictionary I could get. That's a number one. I have a number two question and then a quick comment. All right. I'll, I'll, All right. Well, Peter I'll... Peter didn't come down here to talk about the OED. He's <laughs> no, down happy here to, to talk about Merriam-Webster. Happy to, no, OED is, stands for the Oxford English Dictionary. Of course, it's the great uh, historical dictionary of the English language and a, an absolute uh, joy to use. But I have to tell you, uh, it is an absolutely descriptive uh, uh, work of reference. Um, and the fact is, I don't think you'll be able to find a strictly prescriptive dictionary uh, of English anywhere in, in contemporary language. It's funny because when Samuel Johnson back in the 1740s started his project, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm a product of the Enlightenment. I am going to set the English language down forever. By the end of his project, he said, uh, please make it stop. Right. I, can't, I cannot possibly record the changes and this moving target. And so he recognized, as did Noah Webster later, that again, the only constant of language is change. And so our editor, the Merriam-Webster editor in the 50s, he used to say, tell the truth about words. And that is where this descriptive uh, word came from. I think there's a little bit of a straw man here. Sometimes we oppose prescriptive and descriptive as though there's a little, you know, a little battle going on. But the fact is, uh, in a good dictionary, it will give you good advice. So, for example, the word irregardless is in the dictionary because we find it written so often. But we have a note that says, use regardless instead. So you have the two different uh, facts. You have the lexical fact, the word exists, and then you have the usage fact, which is the cultural judgment that will come to you if you use it. And that's, Mignon, that's probably the, uh, the right way to address some of these problems. I mean, just to come back to the, one of the ones that you cited, the use of literally, to mean fig- usually to mean figuratively, in other words, in, uh, to use its opposite. Or right, well- what I find is people often mix up the function of a dictionary and a style guide. Mm-hmm. So, you know, dictionaries report how language is used. If you want a book that tells you do this, don't do that, what you're really looking for is a style guide. So you might want to check out the Chicago Manual of Style or mm. Garner's Modern American Usage or something like that. Those are the books that attempt to lay down rules. Um, but dictionaries are much more rich and descriptive and and, and tell you everything that's going on, and then, as Peter said, label it as non-standard or something mm-hmm. like that to, to be helpful. 
Well, I mean, but I think dictionaries also are used to resolve questions. And I, having worked at a newspaper for 20 years, I can tell you that style guides are not enough. Sooner or later, you're going to have to go to the dictionary. Uh, you know, I'm saying reclusion is a word. You're saying it's <laughs> not. And ultimately, you know, every newspaper, by the way, has a dictionary which it has picked sure. in addition to its style guide as the thing that the copy di- editor wearily pulls down and goes, well, it's not in here, so we're not using it. So ultimately, it is. It's it's more. I mean, a dictionary in, in those kinds of circumstances has to do the work of both things, the description and the style guide. Well, it serves as a kind of as a kind of authority in that instance. You know, does email have a hyphen, that kind of thing? Do you capitalize a word? And by coincidence, Mignon and I are both appearing at the uh, conference for the American Copy Editors Society in two weeks' time, and uh, there are no more uh, attentive users of dictionaries than copy editors, and they have the best questions, um, and uh, they, they really pay attention to uh, the way uh, words are treated in the dictionary. And you're right. They do have, for, for very basic things, things that most of us don't even think about, where do you break a word uh, if you have to, you know, if you have to put a hyphen in it, for example. Very, very careful uh, editing uh, requires all of that information, and that's what's in a dictionary. And you're right. I mean, it, 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 it becomes a kind of a last, uh, a, a last um, uh, resort. It becomes the authority. You know, Lynn um, uh, Murphy at Linguist uh, um, is the Twitter account. Uh, she's a linguist uh, who's an American who teaches in Britain, did a wonderful wonderful essay um, at the Oxford Dictionary's blog about the difference uh, between British and American pers- perspectives on what dictionaries are. And m- boiling it down, it seemed that the, the British dictionaries were marketed to lovers of language and the American dictionaries were marketed to uh, people who don't want to be wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and that's an interesting cultural distinction. You know, Mignon, it, it just, though, though that, that um, I'm trying to think of the phenomenon that I want to describe here, and I'm hyper-conscious of how I'm using words because of the topic of the show, but so let's pick something like literally. All right, so maybe in the next edition or even this edition of Merriam-Webster, it says, well, some people use it this way, but please use, it, use the other thing. Use figuratively to say that. Don't <laughs> use literally. Okay, and then... You know, five years, ten years go by, and and uh, you know, it just it's more and more and more in vogue, more and more profuse, and so a dictionary comes out and kind of you know as a tertiary meaning says, yeah, sometimes it, it says it means this, you know, and then at a certain point there's this, this kind of Orwellian collapse of meaning which we want to avoid, right, Mignon? There is. There's an example of that that I covered in my last book, 101 Troublesome Words, and that's um, begs the question. Mm. Ah! In in earlier books, I had tried to reinforce the traditional meaning of begs the question, which is a term from logic that means a circular argument. Mm. But when I was working on my last book, I tried to find an example of it being used properly, and I looked at thousands (laughs) of search results and could not find a single instance of it being used, quote, properly. And so I felt, <clears throat> excuse me, I felt as if I, I couldn't make the argument anymore that, that you should hold the line. So instead I told people just don't use it <laughs> because its meaning has become clouded and it doesn't mean what the traditional meaning thinks. I, uh, it, it's essentially a lost cause. And in you know, another, I don't know, 20 or 50 years, no one will even remember that it had <laughs> this formal logic meaning. And it's just used wrong so often now that that has become the standard meaning. So it's language change in process while yes. we're alive and living. And those tend to be the things that annoy people the most. I think one of the things we discovered today is that not only has Beg the Question deteriorated into nothingness, or at least its original meaning has deteriorated into nothingness, but even the kind of example that we used to give has now deteriorated. Because it used to, a typical example of begging the question would be something like, why is sunshine good? Because it's excellent. And now, of course, you'd say, why is sunshine good? Because excellent. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, you wouldn't even do the example the same way. We've got to take a quick break. Uh, we're way over the time limit on this section. We'll come back. This is moving too fast. All right, we're back. It's National Grammar Day. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. We have a lot of calls. We have great guests, uh, and it's going to be hard to cram everything in. In fact, it will be impossible. Peter Sokolowski is joining us. He's editor-at-large at Merriam-Webster. Mignon Fogarty is uh, better known as the Grammar Girl for her podcast and her New York Times bestseller and her upcoming uh, game, Peeve Wars. It's all about the grammar. So, Mignon, um, one of the things that we wanted to talk a little bit about is, is a phenomenon that takes place on the Internet, uh, and it's... Um, 
some people call it grammar bullying. That and, and I think I'm I think I may have committed acts of grammar bullying, at least in the sense that you encounter somebody on a comment thread with whom you profoundly disagree on a matter of policy or philosophy, and you look at what they say and you realize that this person is not able to express himself in his native tongue, and that feels like kind of an opening. Um, <laughs> but but I'm sensing from 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 everything that sort of has come before that that may be the wrong way to to engage with somebody. Well, yeah, it's it's the weakest argument you can make. You're not addressing the point they're making. You're just saying, oh, you can't spell. I mean, how how weak an argument is that? I don't think that you make a good case for your own point by attacking people um, on on their spelling and grammar instead of the content of their argument. I I, I realize it's tempting, <laughs> but but it it just doesn't it it doesn't facilitate you know honest polite discourse and it also is is just you know i think that you should be able to do better if you're trying to make an argument for some point you should be arguing your point not whether the other person can spell you know, this happens pretty interactively peter on twitter and you've mm-hmm. actually sort of had some encounters right yeah i mean uh people uh, sometimes when they meet a dictionary editor they they expect um uh me to sort of be kind of a judge and 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 tell them that oh you know uh, my friend is wrong. My husband's wrong. You know about about something else. And I, you know, I do uh, encourage people to to um, never think of language or or of good grammar and good knowledge um, as a hammer to beat someone up with. <laughs> it's just a it's just a bad idea. And uh, correcting someone's grammar is is almost always bad manners, unless you are a parent or a teacher. Um, then let's stick with the you know <laughs> stick with the ideas and uh, let the let their rhetoric speak for themselves you know uh, let, let let their rhetoric speak for itself I should say um, so that we have uh, you know good and 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 healthy uh, dialogue you know it's funny because as humans we 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 use language language is is the water we swim in um, and then when we're self conscious about it as we are today on Grammar Day. Um, we have to uh, think in, uh, in very new and different uh, and very self-conscious terms. I mean, does a fish know that it's wet? You know, so now we're talking about language in this sort of meta way, um, and we become very critical of other people. Um, I think it's better to sort of step back and take a breath and um, celebrate how, how great the English language is, how flexible it is, uh, and how lucky we are that we don't have to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nobody's perfect. I mean, everyone exactly. is going to have typos and make an occasional error. Here's um, a call from Ed in Glastonbury. Hi, Ed. Hi. How are you? Just fine. I, I need you guys to help me out with this. You know, there's there's a, a couple of uses of words that, that, that people use, and I think I get the feeling that they use them because they're trying to sound smart, but it, mm. it grates me because I think it, it may be incorrect. But when someone says, you know, oh, sorry, you're doing poorly, don't they just mean sorry you're feeling bad? Or, or I mean, doing poorly, it seems like that would be better served by an adjective instead of an adverb. Well, do, doing is a little bit complicated. If mm. they say I'm feeling poorly, mm. now now you're into a, uh, a different. You know what? That's what I meant. I'm okay. sorry. I meant to say feeling. Um, all right. So feeling poorly, we can talk about. And uh, yeah. even though I have the grammar experts here with me, I'll just say to you, Ed, be as am, are, was, were, been, appear, become, feel, look, seem, sound, smell, taste, grow, remain, stay. Those are all state of being verbs, which means that they would, in fact, take what's called a predicate adjective. So I feel poor. I, I don't feel poorly. That's so the, let me that's carry the thing that over to, to the next, the, the other one, too. When someone asks you, how are you? People say, I am well. What's your take on that? I'll let the grammar people uh, take <laughs> over for me. Say, but. I am well or I am good. Um, am is, is one of those linking verbs that Colin um, rattled off. And that was <laughs> yeah, impressive. Did very a te- impressive. Did a teacher, was there a song or something that helped you remember that? No, there was a really scary teacher named Mr. Friedman. <laughs> That's amazing. It's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so um, am, when you say, someone asks how you are, you can say I'm good and it's a reflection on your state. Or if you say well, it tends to be more a reflection on your health is how I've seen it analyzed in usage books. Sure. And in old and in sort of older forms, you know, uh, he's he's poorly. His mother is poorly. It just simply means she's not well. Uh, and that's not uh, very contemporary English. That might be more an 18th century kind of uh, kind of usage, but it is certainly recognizable to me in that way. And another way is another thing to think about is good and well. There, you know, th- there is a little rub between them that is also kind of great about English. So that if you talk about a jazz musician and he plays well, um, uh, uh, that is good. That you know, you, you'd say he plays technically correct. 
uh, music. But if you say, oh, he plays really good, mm. there's an emphasis that comes from the rub, the grammatical rub that you've chosen to add to that. And I think that it's fun to play with language in that way, too, as long as you're controlling it. There's a little bit of what we call code switching in there yes, sometimes, absolutely. too. I mean, so uh, Gene Demby, Demby gives the example of President Obama yes. uh, paying for something, and the guy starts to offer him change, and President o- Pre- President of the United States says, no, we straight. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, because, you know, he's code switching right there. Sure. And that's, but we all do that. I yeah. mean, we all do that. Yeah, uh, politicians do that all the time. Um, we're talking about grammar. Uh, we, we're having uh, a pretty wide-ranging conversation <laughs> about it, as tends to be the case. Our number, 860-275-7266, 860-275-7266. Um, there's a nice segue that I think we can make here because we're, we're talking sort of about also how language changes. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, I'm keenly aware that a number of people have called up to complain about the fact that I insert sort of constantly all the time, and they're absolutely right about that. It's more of a disfluency than a failure to understand syntax, but uh, just bear with me on it. Uh, Joan Bynes is joining us right now. She's the director of the Golden Ball Tavern in Western Massachusetts. That's Western Massachusetts, mm-hmm. an author of Words They Live By, Colonial England Speech, Col- Colonial New England Speech, Then and Now. So, Joan Bynes, the point of your book really kind of is, well, I did it again. The point of your book is if we had a conversation with, say, Samuel Adams or Thomas Hooker um, or John Winthrop, would we be able to understand one another? Um, how different was the speech that they used from the speech that we use? What's the answer to that question? Well, we would have been able to understand one another, but we might have paused at some of the usages. If um, John Adams offered you a curious um, book, you might have expected something that would have made you wonder where he was really saying that this was an excellent book, and even better than excellent. See, I like that. I almost, mm. I, I almost wish we could restore that. Right. Give us another example. Well, um, there are words which actually changed their meaning in the political context as the political context changed. So homespun at first was just homespun. It's what people made when they came to the colonies. And then when people had money, they went out and they bought beautiful cloth from England, and they made beautiful clothing. And homespun became um, something that had uh, you know, a low tone to it. And then when the revolution came close and people were uh, very aware of political context, they re- uh, brought out homespun again and made it into a wonderful patriotic word and urged young women to bring down their spinning wheels and not to marry anybody who wouldn't wear homespun. You know, one of the things that you discover over time, uh, and the the experts have the percentages better, but every time you encounter an idiom or a trope, um, that it, it turns out 50% of the time it's from the Bible and 50% of the time it's from Shakespeare, and fifty percent and 90% of that 50% is Hamlet. Uh, but there yeah, are, but, yeah, but, yeah, but I can give you a bunch I, of them. I know, and I'm leading you to that. So but there's a whole bunch of them that do, do come out of our colonial past. Right. And uh, one of them would be to be at loggerheads, right? Yes. So where does that come from? And actually, at my museum, we have a wonderful loggerhead, and it was an iron pole um, twisted, and it had a bulbous end, and you would stick it into a red-hot blazing fire in the tap room of the fireplace, and then you would thrust it into this drink that you were making called Flip, which was a combination of rum and, um, I think, beer and pumpkin or, or else... Um, it's some kind of a sweetener, but you would thrust the loggerhead into that drink to sear the sweetener in it to make this glass of flip. Yeah, which they, is a very they do serve that at TGI Fridays right now, too. Ah, it's come back. Right. Yeah. So if you were at loggerheads with somebody, you were beyond talking. You were brandishing red hot irons. Ooh. All right, so just let's do one more. Then we have to take a break. We have to come back with some more grammar stuff with Mignon and Peter, and we also have to talk about the apostrophe crisis uh, going on in Great Britain right now. But uh, but how about talk turkey? Where does that come from? Talk turkey is a wonderful one. It's, this is probably an apocryphal story, but a colonist and an Indian went out hunting together in search of game. And before they had left, they had agreed to split the take evenly. At the end of their hunt, they had crows and turkeys in their bag. The colonists started to divide the booty, a crow for the Indian, a turkey for the colonist, a crow for the Indian, a turkey for the colonist. Finally, the Indian confronted him with these words, you talk all turkey for you, only talk crow for Indian. Huh. The time had come for them to have a serious discussion. All right. Well, Joan Bynes, that's great, uh, and a, a book worth looking into, particularly for the linguists and lexicographers we have here today. Uh, that is Words They Live By, Colonial New England Speech, then and now. We'll take a quick break. If you're hanging on, oh, I do want to talk to Mike from West Hartford because he's actually got one that's a little bit of a, a, a thorny knot. A thorny knot? See, the more I try to speak well, the worse it gets. we got the game on to a chance. You're too big for your clothes. 
star case. No, actually, those are examples of colons. You all get Fs. Wait, what? I'm happy that National Grammar Day coincides with National Pancake Day because syrup. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and I. Anna Novak is different than our other interns. Katie Talarski is our impactful executive producer. Greg Hill did less than 100 tweets for us at WNPR Colin and appeared in the intro. The parts of Bill Curry was played by Norm MacDonald. For show pages, articles, and photos of the Faith Middleton Show staff in vinyl Devo suits playing Conjunction Junction, no, that's wrong because the suits aren't playing. The Faith Middleton Show staff, who are not only dressed in vinyl Devo suits, but also playing Conjunction Junction, visit our website, wnpr.org. Tomorrow, the minimum wage debate comes to Connecticut. And now, back to Colin. You can tell I wrote that because of the not only, but also, I'm probably the last human being in the world who actually sort of believes in the integrity of that construction. Talk about a battle we've lost. So we've got uh, Peter Sokolowski with us, editor-at-large at Merriam-Webster, and Mignon Fogarty, uh, better known as the podcaster Grammar, uh, podcaster Grammar Girl. Her books are Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing and the Grammar Devotional. Coming soon, the card game Peeve Wars. Get your uh, crowdfunded version of it right now if you can. So um, before we go to John Richards in, in England, I want to talk uh, locally uh, to the two of you about apostrophes. You mm. know, apostrophes uh, it, it sort of links back a little bit, I think, to what the guy Ed was talking about, where people sort of they think – they want to do something right. They know there's such a thing as an apostrophe. <laughs> they, they're, they're hoping that they know where it goes, but they just sort of put it in, a, in the equivalent of a salt shaker and just kind of <laughs> sprinkle it anywhere, kind of hoping it, it lands a properly, a properly. Mignon, is there, is there more to say about that? Well, I've developed a theory over the years. You know, you see your and their used with an apostrophe when they shouldn't be a lot. And, and I think people in grade school are taught that apostrophes make things possessive. So when they encounter a pronoun that needs to be possessive, they immediately think of the apostrophe. But that rule is only for nouns. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's people getting mixed up between nouns and pronouns that that causes them to make that mistake sometimes. Um, On the other hand, I mean, Peter, a lot of times you'll see a roadside sign that says night crawlers, apostrophe. (laughs) (laughs) I know sometimes it's it's perfectly mysterious what, <laughs> what is meant by the apostrophe in uh, you know and, and there are as you know there, there was a book I think uh, some fellows who uh, went around the country with a black uh, sharpie correcting uh, signs in grocery stores and things like that uh, and uh, you know I, I do think this is a case where uh, especially the your and there those are two things that uh, if you make a mistake uh, in 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 a, in a serious letter or email or uh, or uh, article, um, you know, people will notice, and you you ha- you should be very careful about that stuff. But I also ha- hasten to add, and I'm sure Minyan would agree that you know, when when linguists, when professionals talk about grammar, they really only mean two things: syntax and inflection. So how words connect to each other, and how words uh, are are um, developed through tenses, for example, or or or, or uh, um, with, in the case of nouns with their um, plurals. So the fact is grammar also has this broader sense that goes as far as punctuation and all kinds of um, uh, uh, you know, broad linguistic ideas. And uh, I know that um, Mignon has called it style. I, in the dictionary world, we usually call it usage. And these are sort of different ways of talking about what I would call the manners of language. And that is, you know, minding your P's and Q's. Right. And I'd like to point out that those people who went around correcting signs got arrested because it's vandalism. <laughs> we don't recommend doing that. I was I was going to make that point, too. In fact, uh, one of our staff members here was saying that a friend of his did that in a federal park. And apparently <laughs> the federal government. Uh, they didn't like it. They, they like to have their bad uh, punctuation just the way that they made it. Um, <laughs> Minion, Fo- Minion Fogarty, it's been great to visit you with you. We have to give up that studio in KUNR uh, in Reno, Nevada. Uh, so great to talk to you. And uh, the minute I get off the air, I'm going, wh- where is it? It's crowdfunder? Where can I get the cards? Right. It's at fundanything.com slash pvors. And thanks. Happy National Grammar Day. All right. That's at Fund Anything. Uh, we're going to, in fact, uh, now move across the Atlantic. John Richards is the president of the Apostrophe Society in Great Britain, where they're actually having much the opposite problem. Uh, we have gratuitous profusions of apostrophes in all kinds of places where they're not meant to be. But there was actually, there actually has been a movement, uh, if I am uh, not mistaken, John Richards, to remove apostrophes that are supposed to be there there in street signs? Do I have this right? Uh, there has been an attempt to do this, to impose apostrophes where they're missed out, yes. 
And when we say missed out, did, did it miss, first of all, we should explain what was meant. So in other words, if a, if a street sign said O'Connell Street or Baker's Street, um, the, the government was planning simply not to have that apostrophe in there? Um, I don't know about that particular case, no. Um, but it's usually in possessives, uh, St. Paul's Church Road, that sort of thing. And, and so what was the reason for taking out the apostrophes? I don't know. I have uh, <laughs> approached several councils, local authorities, and they say that it is because it, is, it confuses sat-navs. <laughs> um, I, don't, I can't think why they can't get sat-navs right and keep the apostrophes in. I think it causes great confusion to miss out the apostrophe. But I don't know why the councils are doing this. Oh, first of all, we have to declo- decode uh, the word sat-nav. Sat-navs are our, our GPSs to us. Uh, but uh, at least I, I think I have that, that distinction correct. Yeah, the lexicographer is, is nodding over there. So what did you do about it? How, how were you able to fend this off? Well, uh, I, there have been quite a number of protests. Uh, we at uh, the Apostrophe Protection Society has written to the councils, and two councils have uh, had second thoughts, Mid-Devon and uh, Cambridge have decided to keep the apostrophes in. So you've won two battles, but not the war. Hmm? You have won two battles, but not the whole war. Oh, no, no. But <laughs> these days, it's rather good to win one battle. <laughs> yeah. And is that the sole purpose of the apostrophe society? Is 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 uh, the apostrophe protection society? Is it th- this battle over street signs? Uh, is it what? Sorry. Is is that the, the main reason for the existence of the Apostrophe Protection yes. Society, or do you do, you do other yes. things? I, I, I was just very annoyed about apostrophe misuse, so I formed the society. And how many members does it have now? Uh, well, we don't have members as such, <laughs> but our website has had well over a million hits. Ah, mm. All right. And so- I, constant, I receive a, a flow of emails oh. asking for advice. <laughs> well, you're the go- you're what we call in America the go-to guy then. John Richards, thanks so much for talking to us about that. Um, very quickly here, Peter Sokoleski, we've got a couple of calls here, and I wanted to get to, uh, I was just about to see whether Mike was still there or not. He might have hung up, but I think John is asking the same question, and I bet in the minute or so that we've got left that we could probably cover it. Hi, John in West Hartford. Hey, Colin, how are you? Just fine. Uh, I think you and I grew up in the same kind of household where <laughs> our, our parents tried to drill good grammar into us. Things that I hear today, um, for example, the phrase "exact same" <laughs> gives me chills. <laughs> That's uh, idiomatic. Very, now I don't know. I'd go. I'd, I'd let that one go. Uh, and and the, the use of none or anyone as plurals. Mm. Um, everyone, uh, you know, <laughs> none of them are good. Or none of them are smart. Well, I think the everyone, this is the everyone and the anyone, Peter. I think that's a pretty complicated thing because it's it, it often sounds wrong or at least awkward to say everyone who leaves the classroom should pick up his or her hat. Right. right. Uh, I mean, that's really what you should say. Yeah. It, the, ten, the temptation is to say everyone leaving the classroom should pick up their hats. Right, right. It's what's known uh, as notional you know, notional uh, plural mm-hmm. in that case, uh, because the word does seem to indicate a singular, but of course you're, the, the idea is a, a, a broader one. So that, you know, the, the notional plural, if it's, especially if it's close syntactically to the, to the verb, you end, up, you end up going with the plural. Uh, and, you know, there's also, of course, there's a regional issue. The British would use a plural uh, for, you know, all, all group nouns, like the Senate are voting, mm-hmm. the crowd uh, are loving it, that kind of thing. All right, we are. We can't undertake a new thing. We've only got sixty seconds left. So instead, I'll thank uh, Peter Sokolowski. He's editor at large at Merriam-Webster. He blogs at Merriam-Webster unabridged. Appears in Ask the Editor videos uh, at Merriam-Webster.com, and he's an expert around language. Sorry, I just did that to make Scott's <laughs> head a throb. He was named among Times uh, one 140 best Twitter feeds of 2013. That's very impressive. Thanks to all of our other guests and for uh, Betsy Kaplan for pulling this whole thing together. We'll be back tomorrow with a show about minimum wage. I'll also be hosting Where We Live tomorrow as we get ready for President Obama's visit. Grammar, grammar, it's terribly important. It makes one feel superior, even when one oughtn't. Grammar, like manners, an achievable goal. To improve your chances on the whole. Grammar, grammar, it's terribly important. It makes one feel superior, even when one oughtn't. Grammar, like manners, an achievable goal. To improve your chances on the whole. I bet there's a comma missing there somewhere. I feel well. For me and my Bobby McGee. Bobby McGee and I. I can't get any satisfaction. 
Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Now this song gets it right. Coming up.